Hello, hello. Hi, guys. Welcome to the green space at WNYC WQXR. We are the live on stage and on screen space for this fabulous place. How many people are here for the first time? Amazing. Problematic as well. <laughs> but I'm going to celebrate the amazing part of it. Welcome. How many people here are members of WNYC? Thank you so much. You keep everything that we do going. All right. So tonight is a very special night. My name is Christina Newman Scott. I'm the executive director of the Green Space. And I want to shout out our president and CEO, LaFontaine Oliver. <laughs> Andrew Golis, our Andrew, here you are, our chief content officer, and Kenya Young, who is the head of studios, as well as the incredible beyond brilliant Radio Lab team who works so hard to bring you all this amazing show. So tonight, as you know, we're thrilled to present Radio Lab's mixtape series live with Simon Adler alongside musical accompaniment from composer Alex Overington and special guest Tara Isabella Burton. But first, I want to tell you that on July 12th, we're doing our own hip hop anniversary. Hip, can I say that? Hip hop, I mean, hello. Somebody's going to take my card. Hip hop anniversary right here. And we're celebrating women in hip hop because it's never, you can't do that enough. So stay tuned to that. Go on our website, www.greenspace.org and get tickets come on July 12th. And so without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Radio Lab hosts, Lulu Miller and Latif Nasser. <laughs> Woo. Woo. All right. Hey. Here we are. He he is Latif. She's Lulu. This is Radio Lab. Live. <laughs> and we have the distinct honor, privilege to introduce our senior producer. Resident vaporwave musician. Coverer of such topics as endangered rhinoceroses in Namibia contested elections in Ireland, uh, convincing deep fakes that are toppling democracies across the world, and even more high stakes than all of that, the cassette tape. <laughs> okay, so when Simon came to us about a year ago and pitched not just one story, but an entire series, five episodes on the cassette tape, um, okay, I, I am, I, it's, I was like, not that I was worried, but I was <laughs> worried. And what I, I mean, I'm a child of the 80s. I love cassette tapes. I have a profound affection for the clickety clack of these things. But like, are you going to get a story out of it? Are you going to get six stories? Are you going to milk emotion and stakes? I worried it was going to just be like a hipster gearhead ode to the weirdly superior because inferior sound quality magnetic tape. I had my concerns. But Simon Adler. He pushed past those concerns. He managed to dig up stories that were obscure, that were fascinating, that were beautiful, even, uh, about tapes. He, yeah, he, he, he managed to do all of that and to, um, yeah, to, to string them together in a way that was, you know, musical, that was playful, that had big thinky thoughts in there, too. <laughs> Um, and yeah, it's like, it's, he's made, I think, you listen for yourselves, I think he made a convincing case that this humble little thing right here remade our sense of reality. His series mixtape, if you haven't heard it, won all kinds of accolades. It had all kinds of feelings. I cried. He, he did do it. And, and it told stories that crisscrossed the globe. We went to China, to Sudan, to, the, to Vietnam, to Iran. And as if taking you all across the globe was not enough. Uh, tonight, in this very theater, he will take you off of the globe entirely. A Never Heard Story is coming your way. So without any further ado, let's bring out our captain on this journey. He has curated a Fantasia. Sit back, relax, and give a big hand for Sam and Adler! <laughs> Too kind, 
too kind. You're too kind. Thank you, Lulu and Letif. That was too kind, way too kind. Uh, we're going to just stand here for one second to make sure that all this works. We got the thumbs up, and now it's time to go. So despite the fact that we're all here tonight to talk about cassette tapes, I'm actually going to start by playing you a clip from one of my favorite records of all time. Our assembly guest today is Mr. Paul Yearout, who has devoted the past 24 years working with teenagers. Today, Mr. Yearout will speak on the subject, the now generation versus the stereo generation. Mr. Yearout. Right, so this record, it is this traveling preacher, uh, Tex Yearout, and he's in this high school gymnasium back in the 1960s you know, to talk to these kids basically about how to be better teenagers, how to get through this messy new stage of life. Well, thank you very much. It's certainly a great pleasure to be in your school today, and I do appreciate all of you taking time to come to this assembly. Of course, I don't suppose you had too much choice, but that's the breaks. I realize when I And you know, if he's going to talk to teenagers, like he's got to talk about alcohol, drinking, and driving. And of course. Brings me to another subject I'd like to talk about, a little three-letter word that you spell, sex. <laughs> you know, there's a big communication gap between your generation and mine, but it's nowhere as evident as in this area because we seldom ever talk about the subject, or we do it in some ridiculous manner, where a guy gets up in front of a bunch of people like you and says, <laughs> now this afternoon, children, I, uh, <laughs> I want to talk to you about sex. <laughs> And you all sit back laughing up your sleeves because you know more than the guy speaking. I mean, for an evangelical preacher, the dude's pretty funny, right? Uh, and well, you know, he does give some pretty cringy dated advice throughout the record, uh, which I won't play for you. Uh, it does seem like he's really trying to build these kids up to help them sort of believe in themselves. My young friends, you are the future, the only future there is. And with your wonderful minds and great opportunities, I plead with you to prepare yourselves to lead America and our world to a bright future, free of the tyranny, the hate, and the killing that's going on all over this world today. God help us. And I know you can do it, if you will. I want to commend you on being a fantastic audience. I know it's not comfortable in those bleachers. I can't believe your fine department, your wonderful response. It surely says something to me about you. And this is why I have great hope in your generation. Thank you, and may God bless you. You may not be with me at all on this, and that's okay, but I have to admit, the first time I listened to this thing, I sort of fell in love with this guy. I mean, yeah. I'm always intrigued by parents to stand around and tell their teenagers now, see here. I certainly fell in, with, in love with the way he sort of transported me to a different time, and the way he let me think about problems that weren't quite mine, but were still relatable. As I said, it's sort of hard for me to put my finger on exactly why I got hooked so hard by this thing, but I did. And so, hooked, I spent years, literally years, flipping through stacks of vinyl at Goodwill and used record shops, looking for anything, anything, anything like this Tex Out record. But there was nothing. Honest to God, there was nothing. Until one day, I went from the vinyl section to the cassette section. How to raise happy, confident kids. Building your child's self-esteem. Chakra hookup. Psychic experimentation with hypnotist Dick Sutphin. <laughs> Light her fire. How to ignite passion and excitement in the woman you love. <laughs> uh, finding these things was a big deal for me. And so... I started wondering, you know, why on this, but not on this? Fortunately for you all, because it would be a boring evening if not, the answer to that question is actually pretty interesting. Uh, and it also says a whole hell of a lot about what is going on right here and right now. 
What you consider real and fake has become a question of where you're sitting. Personal and political polarization at a 20-year high. I mean, as we're about to see, the story of these self-help tapes is really the story of how we collectively started unraveling. And so, tonight I've got a show in three acts for you. Uh, we're going to go from a mall to the dark side of the moon and back, rewinding into the not-so-distant past to try to figure out, I guess, just how the hell did we all end up feeling so alone? But first, let's start at the beginning with this guy. I'm Chad Helmstetter, and uh, I'm glad to be with you. Okay, well, uh, you mind if I just jump in with some questions for you? Please do. Okay. Now, now, Shad is what I would call a big idea guy. Uh, he th grew up in Minnesota, lives in Florida today, and I called him up to tell me about one of these big ideas he had on a shopping trip back in 1981. I was in a store in Scottsdale, Arizona. Kmart offers gift certificates to make your shopping more enjoyable. It was probably a Kmart, and, uh, you know, he's walking up and down the aisles, checking out what's new. And I saw... Sony's first blue and silver Walkman. It was the Sony TPS L2. And Shad, this guy, he had never seen anything like it. In fact, he had never worn headphones in public before. But you know, it was sitting out for people to try, and so he a little sheepishly picked it up. I put the earphones in. Pressed play. And it was absolutely breathtaking and inspiring it was it was i thought it was magic <laughs> and shad he was not alone tuning out and tuning in about 750,000 people nationwide are doing just that i can turn it up loud enough so i can drown out the sound just put you in your own world all by yourself where the walkman went these surreal, almost transcendent experiences seemed to follow. I remember vividly that walking or uh, roller skating or dancing, there was this kind of disconnect from my normal everyday experience. Uh, that right there, that is Juliet Christensen. She is a historian of design at the University of London. She's dug deep into the history of the Walkman. And she says, for her at least, it was so disorienting because before this point, like her life had almost felt like a documentary. Like, you know, her eyes were the camera's lens capturing the world around her. But that once she put those headphones on, it almost seemed like the camera floated out of her eyeballs and started to point back at her. Suddenly I'm in this film, right? And I'm the star. The protagonist. I'm singing in the rain. Gene Kelly tap dancing through the, the streets. in the rain. Or maybe... an action hero running from the bad guys, or... a teenager in love for the first time all over again. She says with the Walkman, the music was just for her. She'd never experienced that before. Anyhow, back inside of that Kmart. I, I recognized then that Sony would sell millions of them and others. And Shad, he was still standing there in the electronic section, you know, still in a bit of a daze from this experience he'd just had. And he started to imagine the implications, the, the sort of consequences of this device. Well, that's correct. But um, I wasn't thinking about it in terms of music, which is how everyone else was probably thinking about it at that time. I was thinking about it in terms of the tool to rewire the brain. I mean, what if we could change how we think by listening to cassette tapes? Now, as out there as this idea might sound, uh, it had at least a, a little bit of grounding. Shad, he believed in the power of repetition. Back in the 60s, he was stationed with the Navy, and he was told to learn Spanish and do it fast. And when you're in the military and you're told to do something, you tend to do it. <laughs> and so... Imitate the Spanish words as closely as you can. ¿Quién es él? Es mi padre. 
So he got himself a reel-to-reel tape player, some Spanish language tapes, and started listening to them over and over. ¿Quién es él? Es mi padre. And over and over. ¿Quién es él? And over. Es mi padre. And over and over again. I became reasonably fluent in a fairly short period of time, and that, that notion stuck. And I thought, well, if you can learn a whole new language by listening to it repeatedly. You know, why couldn't you learn other ways of thinking doing the exact same thing? To be more confident, for instance. And when I held that Sony Walkman in my hand, I remember thinking, now anyone could do it. And so what the guy do? He got a microphone and a recorder. And uh, if you all would, you, you all have headphones. Uh, I'm going to ask you to put the headphones on. Make sure that, there's a, that the light is on, because if the light isn't on, the headphones aren't going to be working. Anyhow, uh, I want you to put these on, because I want you to have the real experience, as he intended, uh, for you to listen to this. So take a deep breath and enjoy Shad's creation here. You are incredible. That's right, you. You have a lot going for you. You always did. And now it's time to let yourself live out the incredible potential that you were born with. You've had it all the time. You were born to be an exceptional human being. And each day you give yourself the winning words of self-talk that say, I like myself. I'm glad to be me. I like myself. I'm glad to be me. I like myself. I'm glad to be me. Anyone feeling more confident? <laughs> Maybe a little bit cringy? Uh, I kind of like the, the, the thing he made, but even if you hate it, what you have to give Shad is that he was on to something. I worked for the company back in the records days, and you know it, it was going nowhere. It kind of had to you know, shut down parts of the business to keep it surviving. This is Vic Conant. Throughout the 1970s, he had been trying to sell messages like Shad's there on vinyl records with no success. But suddenly, with the Walkman and the exact same material now printed onto magnetic tape, the business took off. All of a sudden, we were selling millions and millions of these cassettes every month. Like a record exec, Vic went out and signed folks like Shad, published their material. And well, at the beginning, he says most of their products were like Shad's, you know, very affirming, very motivational. You can be and have all that you want in life. Playing this tape over and over again, you will develop your unlimited potential. As time went on, customers started demanding more and more specific products, like how to improve their memory. I'd like to personally welcome everyone to the Mega Memory Program. Or how to be better at business. Welcome to how to deliver unpopular messages, an instructional tape from American Management Association. <laughs> Eventually, things got very, very weird. You know, spirituality became a big segment for us. All right, you're going to have to put your headphones on again for this to get the, the real effect. I promise it's going to be worth it. Again, <gasps> deep breaths. Just enjoy. The As dream. the group met was similar in the large to auditorium one man. They had experienced no before. idea. He was exactly alone. in a theater. What was in store watching for them a movie. For the information and secure that they had. But the movie was sketchy did at not best have a plot line. All they knew that he could understand was that they were and as hard, hard as he tried. Again, he was stuck. I think it's totally fair for you all to be wondering what the hell was going on there. Uh, <laughs> it's like these two dueling fairy tales, one in the left ear, one in the right ear. If you try to follow one, you immediately lose the other. 
Okay, I'm going to tell you the trick, how the trick is done right now. I'm okay, going to expose yeah. the contents of, of this idea, which, by the way, the first time it happened, it was an accident. Ladies and gentlemen, psychoanalyst, hypnotist, and the mind behind these hypno-peripheral processing tapes, Lloyd Glauberman. Uh, as he told me, his tapes are almost like those uh, trick images that you have to like cross your eyes to see what's actually there. Uh, in these tapes, if you want to hear the hypnotic message, what you have to do is listen to what is being said between the two stories. Are we following? If not, that's okay again. <laughs> so for example though, uh, if the story in the right ear says... The word feel. In the left ear, what would often follow was... The word better. <laughs> okay. So the listener at that moment in time, the only thing that's actually available for that, that split two seconds is feel better. Now, what Lloyd made there, uh, and I think this is part of why I love it, like, it literally could not have existed without this thing, right? Like, it needed headphones, it needed stereo sound. And Shad's creation that we heard a second before with the headphones, it definitely would not have been successful without it. I mean, could you imagine playing that in your living room <laughs> with it saying, I like myself, I'm glad to be me? <laughs> your roommate, your wife, your husband, they're next door, like, it's just not gonna work. <laughs> and so for me, at least, as I was looking into all this, it started to seem like this blue box, this was responsible for this entire self-help movement. However... I could pick that apart as a critical theorist of, of media by saying, well... Please do. Pick, pick it apart, yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, again, Julia Christensen, and she says, eh, you idiot, that's not the whole story here. There's something else as well, which is that the, the kind of period of success of self-help right, the 1980s, when it really kind of came to prominence, was a particular social and political climate. Simply said, everything else that was going on in the world, that was important too, and that uh, at the time, the world's most influ influential man was this cowboy. Yes. I'm sure everybody in the audience here loves him, Ronald Reagan. Uh, and well, he's remembered and derided, especially here in New York, uh, for being uh, sort of a hater on big government. He also loved and cherished the power of the individual. If we look to the answer as to why for so many years we achieved so much, prospered as no other people on earth, it was because here in this land, we unleash the energy and individual genius of man to a greater extent than has ever been done before. The guy even wrapped this message in some pretty self-helpy language. There are no constraints on the human mind, no walls around the human spirit, no barriers to our progress except those we ourselves erect. I mean, he seemed to be saying... Take care of yourself. Be the best version that you can be. It's all about you, and you, and you. Nothing is impossible. Man is capable of improving his circumstances beyond what we're told is fact. And this political message, when it collided with this personal technology, Juliet says, that is when self-help exploded. Almost like a chemical reaction, both parts had to be there, and once they were, this resulting blaze was almost impossible to contain. Which, to me at least, makes these tapes so much more than just some woo-woo fad of the 1980s. I mean, seen in this light, they were an early manifestation, a warning, perhaps, of where we were headed. So why, why was this such a big deal? What, why was the Walkman such a big deal? Yeah, yeah. Because you could choose your own music. She thinks I'm such an idiot. I mean, it's simple as that. You, you could choose the sounds that you wanted to listen to. Which, you know, also meant that you, you could choose what you wanted to listen to, and you right there, 
you could choose what you wanted to listen to. Which, you know... Which can be kind of joyful, but radically alters your relationship with society. Now, to see what she means by that, uh, I want to try a little something with you all. Uh, once more, if you would, put your headphones on. We're just going to sit here. Uh, we're going to watch a brief 60-second video clip. And as you're watching it, all I want you to do is, you know, notice the thoughts that you're having. Notice physically how your body is reacting. So, again, just uh, take a deep breath. Look up this, at the screen, watch, and listen. All right. Uh, anybody anybody f feel sort of anxious? Raise your hand if you felt a little anxious. Okay, talk to me about it. What were you, what were you, yeah, wh what did you notice inside yourself during it? It felt like something bad was about to happen. Something bad was about, what, what, what were you imagining? Um, that there was going to be a big disaster and I was watching <laughs> people right before it happened. Like a bomb was about to go off or something maybe? Yeah. Okay, we got, we got, do people relate to that? Bomb going off? Anybody not relate to that? Okay, right here. Yeah. What? what yeah. Right there. Yeah. 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 What, what? What was your? What was your feeling to the whole thing? It just kind of seemed like a normal day in the mall. Normal day in the mall. Okay. We've got an. Uh, anybody not react to either normal day in the mall or sort of like, oh my God, a bomb is going to go off. Okay. Right here. I heard a little kid's voice. Okay. Oh, you okay? Right, right, right. That kid could be lost. He needs his mom. He needs and then his dad. I saw the maternity sign, and then I saw some flash on little kids, and I was worried that kids were lost or trapped. All right, you were reading way more into this thing than was ever designed <laughs> to be read into it, but I appreciate it. Um, okay, so what what we did here uh, is essentially we uh, we had three different soundtracks. Each of you was assigned one of the three soundtracks, and the reason for it was to you know provoke a different mood. So there was one that, yes, was very, oh my god, a bomb's going to go off. Another was this sort of bubbly, boop, boop, dee, doo, doo. and then the last one was, yes, just children and sort of the ambient sound. Um, now, why the hell did we do this? <laughs> because, you know, like, this feeling that uh, we just had, this sort of mumblings I'm hearing here of, oh my god, you experienced something different than me. What, what happened? That is a numbingly common experience today, but before the Walkman, it was not possible. This thing allowed for the first time for us to collectively see, but individually experience, to sit together while remaining worlds apart. And this, to me at least, it seems, is the world that these tapes portended, a world with a new meaning of the word together a world where not only our sounds could be personal, but our truths and our realities.
with our palate now cleansed. Let's widen the aperture here a little bit, shall we? Because, uh, well, the 1980s certainly was a moment when this fragmentation that we all just experienced in the audience here uh, went into overdrive. It didn't start there or end there. And so I'm very excited to uh, kick off act two here uh, by inviting to the stage Tara Isabella Burton, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Tara had a bit of a traumatic uh, afternoon where her house almost burned down. So, uh, <laughs> you know, some things are more important than radio making. But uh, here we are making radio nonetheless. It's fine. The fire department came. It was a boiler issue. Nothing permanent happened. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so I've just told the story, I think, hopefully, you'll all have to tell me if I have or haven't, of Ronald Reagan and this Walkman coming together and creating this sort of self-help uh, explosion. And I think I've brought you here to tell me how wrong I am, or at least, uh, yeah, well, we'll stick with that, how wrong I am. Is that, is that fair? About 50% wrong. Okay, I'll take 50%. I, I guess I do need to know, or maybe the folks out there need to know, sort of why should they trust you over me, though? Thanks so much for asking, Simon. <laughs> As it happens, I just wrote a book on this ah! very topic. Uh, Self-Made, Creating Our Identities from Da Vinci to the Kardashians comes out on Tuesday. And it is an intellectual history of self-creation, self-making, and the self-improvement cult in America. Wow, okay, so yeah, you're the right person to talk to here. Uh, <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, right. Okay, but talk to me here. So I, our story starts here, I guess, in 1979, 1981, with the launch of the Walkman. You're saying the story starts before that? Absolutely. Um, the the self-help tradition, and in particular, this idea that you can manifest or will yourself into health or wealth or other parts of uh, your best life by looking inwards and doing very individualistic work, that is really inculcated into the American consciousness, particularly from the 19th century onward, when a uh, perhaps little remembered movement called New Thought uh, was basically the first self-help craze in America. Okay, and so New Thought, uh, who is our, our, our Shad Helmstetter of, of New Thought? Who was who sort of pioneering this thing? So the, the sort of inventor, progenitor of New Thought was a uh, clockmaker in New Hampshire called Phineas Quimby in the 1860s. Phineas Quimby, okay. And he started out as a, um, as a faith healer uh, and a mesmerist, uh, a hypnotist, whose whole thing was uh, can he uh, heal people who were sick through, let's say, Parascientific methods. Okay, let's get parascientific though. Th this is Reiki healing? This is hands over the body sort of thing? It's vibes, yeah. Vibes, okay. <laughs> okay, um, so, so the, the, the clockmaker is hovering his hands. He's making people better. And he, uh, he noticed something very interesting, which is that uh, sometimes it didn't work. <laughs> and people didn't get better. But, you know, sometimes they did. <laughs> and he thought to himself, he's like, what could possibly be the cause of this disparity? Could it be that what I'm doing doesn't work? No, it must be the patient who is wrong. Yeah, blame some it. patients want to get better and some don't. And from this, he developed this idea of a kind of mix of really positive thinking and manifesting uh, that if you could just look inwardly, if you could focus on getting better, you would get better. And if you didn't think hard enough, you wouldn't. And this started out, uh, he, he did not write anything down, but he got many uh, uh, friends and admirers and followers, one of whom was Mary Baker Eddy, who founded uh, the Christian science tradition in an effort to marry new thought and, uh, and Christianity. But also more broadly, new thought became a self-help craze beyond this one man, uh, starting with uh, the pursuit of health. It became so popular, it was also known as the mind cure, which is very cool. I like that, that more than, um, than William thought, James, yeah. the uh, brother of Henry uh, and, and uh, philosopher and, and student sociologist of religion wrote about how you couldn't even sneeze in parts of Boston because if you sneezed or talked about having a cold or be like, no, 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 don't talk about it. That's negative. That's negative. Don't be negative. You'll make us all sick with your negative energy. <laughs> um, but 
uh, towards the end of the 19th century in, in what's known as the Gilded Age, increasingly this new thought became used not just for health, but for wealth. You could positive think your way into being rich if you just wanted it badly enough. Okay, so this goes back a lot longer than our little story told, but come on, you gotta give Ronald Reagan some credit here, right? He was, uh, you know, you're not ready to. In this, some credit okay. for some definition of some. Uh, <laughs> okay. What I mean is that this idea that looking in yourself and getting in touch with your feelings and that getting in touch with your feelings can somehow connect with the energy out there in the universe. Not only does it uh, derive specifically from new thought and similar traditions, but also in the context that you're talking about, um, the most recent time in American history that this obsession with authenticity and looking inward for, for spirituality to kind of manifest what you wanted or bring outcomes into the universe, you really find that in the, in the counterculture of the, the late, of the 1960s, the, the hippies, if you want to call them that, who... So, um, wait, 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 just to jump in, but you, you're saying it's not Reagan, it's the hippies. Yes. Take uh, that, liberal New York, you know? <laughs> and I, I'm not blaming uh, the hippies. I, I, I love the hippies. But uh, one of the things that the counterculture really did was... Um, so many people became obsessed with this idea of looking looking within that society out there didn't have the answers. Other people had the answers. But whatever divine power was there in the universe, whatever spark of energy or truth existed, could be accessed by looking in your own self. Now, when you combine that in inherent tendency with... Uh, unfettered capitalism, say, uh, and then plug in this existing American tradition of think and grow rich and imagine your way into untold success and, of course, blame those who aren't, quote-unquote, successful as simply not trying hard enough or wanting it badly enough. What you get is a kind of distinctly American cultural cocktail of all the worst possible things. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, okay, if you've taken down Reagan as being at the heart of some of this, you got to give me the Walkman at least, right? Like the, the cassette tape, it's this intimate thing. I let the fear just sent me an article today about how headphones make people more believable. The sounds inside your head here. The medium is the message. You got to give me that one, no? I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, yes, the medium is the message, absolutely. And I, I am sure that the, the Walkman as a piece of personal technology was hugely influential as technology tends to be in shaping how we interact with texts and one another. But you've, um, the same kind of arguments have been made uh, very credibly about another piece of very private technology that allows us to have individual experiences unmeted by others, by which I mean the printed book. Ah, the word, yes. Yes, and uh, there's a, um, uh, a lot of scholars will, or historians of this period will argue, and I, I, I absolutely buy this, that you couldn't have the Protestant Reformation, for example, uh, a religious tendency that's very much centered around the idea that you can have a direct and unmediated relationship with God by reading the Bible if you don't have people who can read the Bible. That having um, both texts, access to texts, and the ability to read them was hugely uh, transformative in how human beings saw themselves and saw other people, that there was this sort of element of privatization of narrative and personal life that really shaped human history. And I think we see that with every um, major technology, be it film, be it uh, television or, or sort of film that can come into your homes, be it the internet and the smartphone, all of these don't just make being human easier or more efficient. They also make being human different. And they make how we relate to one another a little bit different. And um, I think that the Walkman is one of many inventions that can be said to be on this journey of making us a little bit more inward or a little bit more uh, prone to thinking of our ourselves as maybe divine beings who can control the vibes of the universe 
and who have the power and maybe the obligation to have our best lives or the least the lives we want. Okay, well, so if you've totally thrown water on this lovely little fire I thought I had built, uh, at least uh, take us to the future. Like, you, you, you've used the past to undermine me, but I am curious what your thoughts are on, on, uh, <laughs> on the future, where we're headed. I don't think you're, I don't think you're wrong. I okay. think yours, this is one chapter in a much bigger story. Ah, there we um, are. Okay. okay. But I think that where we're going uh, really interests me because the internet simultaneously in some ways, it is, we are hi hyper connected as it were. But another way we are hyper private. Uh, what terrifies me about the internet is that a lot of the new thoughty, magic-y vibe stuff of if you can dream it, it will come true. If you can imagine it, it exists. That is true online or when we're in virtual space that that is a the landscape of that is actually uh downstream of our desires what we click on and what we want to see and where we put our attention in turn defines what we will see and the news headlines we see and the people we come in contact with and so more and more of us spend our lives in a space that um kind of runs on the new thought logic of want something badly enough and it will come true. And I think that there's a, a real, real significant correlation between um, internet culture and the fact that more than 50% of Americans now say that they believe in manifesting. Yeah, it's a bunch of garbage if you ask me. There's no manifesting anyhow. But okay, what does this mean for sort of self-help as we see it? What does this mean for, and what, what does this mean if, okay, if we've just continued to fragment further and further while we're focused more inward and inward, what, what's the next phase of somebody telling me how to be better at myself? Well, I think the problem was, what does it mean to be better at yourself? What are, what, what's the actual goal here? And often when we break down this, this question of what does it mean to live our best lives or to self-actualize, um, what, what does that actually look like? Does that have a uh, moral weight? Does that involve the obligations we have to one another, to our communities, to our families, to our friends? Is this something that is a collective goal or is this just like a fancy way of talking about having the things that we think we want, which may or may not be either good for us or what we actually want. What, you know, the, the vision of our best lives is something that uh, the media constantly tells us we should have. Um, I feel like every time I'm on the subway, I see some sort of advertisement for like a quasi spiritual, like it's like kombucha, but the, the tagline is, you know, just like manifest the energy in the world and you too will be the like magician of great power. It's lemon flavored. Um, <laughs> and I, I really do worry. I don't think that self-help is bad at all. But I think that the idea that what we should seek in life is to become who we want to be or to uh, have the life that we want overlooks the fact that, A, we're humans. We're really flawed. A lot of the times we don't know what we want. And, e and sometimes we also want things that are bad for us. Uh, that this, is, this is like very you know, human nature one-on-one. -on -one. And I, I think that a vision of self-help that takes us too much on the inward journey risks giving us an excuse to um, turn away from our more collective moral obligations to one another. I want other help. That's what we want. Other help. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Tara Isabella Burton, thank, thank you so you. much. She's going to be selling books afterwards. You won't regret it. It's not out till Tuesday, but you can buy some here. Okay, to close this thing out, we've got one more story for you. It requires us to move everything ever so slightly. Alex has to flip the tape, obviously. <laughs> but really, he does have to flip the tape. Woo! Go, Alex! <laughs> uh, okay. So, last story here tonight uh, is about maybe the craziest collect collective experience we, we humans have ever had and the one dude who was left out. <laughs> 
Thank you. Except you don't have the effect of, <laughs> I mean, is the juice really worth the squeeze? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. It's a story that was originally told to me by uh, the guy you heard there, Zach Taylor, who happens to be in the audience here this evening. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, he, he is a documentary maker, fellow fan of cassette tapes. I shot and directed a documentary called Cassette, a documentary mixtape. How many cassette tapes do you think you have? Oh my gosh. Um, I probably have a couple thousand. Anyhow, as he says, story starts in the summer of 1969 as the crew of Apollo 11 are about to blast off to the moon. And along with all of their space gear and all of their training, these guys are carrying with them a thing that no man had ever held before. The name of this thing was the TC-50. It looked like a sleek, elegant, minimalist aluminum brick. And what it was, really, was a prototype of the Walkman. It's a little bit bigger than the one they would release to the public some 10 years later, uh, definitely a bit heavier, uh, but functionally the only real difference was this little red button on the top. It's a record button. And this red button, you could argue, was sort of the beginning of content creation. I mean, for the first time with this thing, these astronauts, and eventually, yes, the rest of us non-astronauts could easily record ourselves. Um, this red button would eventually evolve into dual-deck cassette recorders that let us record from tape to tape and curate and mix and insert ourselves into media in ways that we totally take for granted today. And this red button is actually the reason why these stupid cassette players were allowed on board. Because the gloves that these guys used even, even today, I'm sure, like, an astronaut's glove is not conducive to, like, jotting down your thoughts. And, I mean, the more I think about it, the more mission critical this thing is. Uh, mission critical? Yeah, like, yes, mission critical, because they're going like Star Trek, where no man has gone before. You know, you gotta record it like no man had ever done before. And so, July 16th, 1969. These three astronauts had about a three days journey to get to the moon or to get to the moon's orbit. And as they're being flung through space, folks at NASA, of course, they're listening to everything that was going on up there. And there are moments here that you can hear these guys using their, their Walkmans. This is Apollo Control at 59 hours, 9 minutes. Uh, Apollo 11 now 182,000 nautical miles from Earth, and a velocity down to 3,072 feet per second. Yeah, so each astronaut had a personalized mixtape with music that they took with them up to the moon. And uh, apparently the music is uh, triggering the uh, box-operated microphones and we're getting intermittent music down from spacecraft. Now, uh, NASA co-signed this. The thought was, we got to send these guys up with tapes to record onto. Might as well fill them with music first. So. Mickey Cap, the record executive, would go ask each astronaut, hey, what's your favorite song? Okay, thank you, hold my beer. I'll come back with a mixtape for you. And as Zach tells it, uh, the music these guys brought with them, well, it offers a little peek into each of their personalities. So, for example, the straight-laced mission commander. Neil Armstrong's cassette has... this kooky album from the 40s on it. That's an old uh, favorite of mine, about, uh, an album made about 20 years ago, called Music Out of the Moon. 
Armstrong's a bit hard to hear there, but yes, he took an album to the moon called Music Out of the Moon. <laughs> There's a lot of theremin on there. Uh, take a listen. Neil Armstrong, like that was his jam. And in fact, Neil played this stuff on board so much that there were times that NASA would have to call up and say, hey, Neil. Hello, we're breaking. Can you turn that off? Can you turn that music off, please? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Story goes that Buzz, the big talking space cowboy, he requested a very particular song on his tape so that at the moment they touch down on the lunar surface, he'd be able to reach behind him, pull out his tape player. His TC-50, his proto Walkman, and press play to fly me to the moon. And then let me do, 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 do. among the stars. Are you serious? Let that's how, that's the legend. That's the legend. That's how, it, that's how the story goes. Yes, Buzz told this on multiple occasions to multiple words, people. But years later, after he sobered up, he said, eh, maybe that didn't happen. But listen, if a whole building of rocket scientists can believe enough to send these three young men out into space, then I am going to exercise this little, you know, faith the size of a mustard seed and believe that Buzz Aldrin reached behind his seat to play Fly Me to the Moon, because what, a, what an amazing moment. You. <laughs> now, this moment, uh, and these playlists generally, sort of things that, you know, tape heads like me can't get enough of. And I sort of think that's all they would have been were it not for the third astronaut on the mission, this guy, Michael Collins. Now, it turns out his playlist has been lost to time. I reached out to NASA's archives. I reached out to the National Archives, the Smithsonian. No one has any idea whatever happened to this tape or really much of what was ever on it, which I think is sort of fitting. Michael Collins is the one guy nobody knows. The third wheel. He's just the guy who, like, you know, in history, like, they couldn't have done it without him? Like, they really needed him? What did they need him for? <laughs> But Michael Collins was the linchpin in all this stuff. Uh, Michael Collins was the one who made sure that they, first of all, got to the moon, and more importantly, made sure that they got home. So, to pick the story back up, July 20th, four days into the mission, around 2 p.m. here in New York, it was time to actually go down onto the moon. And so, Buzz and Neil, they crawl into the far end of the spacecraft, the lunar landing module that they called the Eagle. They sealed the airlock, and they detached. Meaning the whole time that they were down there on the moon, Collins, he was going to be up there all by himself, just waiting. Michael Collins had 21 and a half hours, almost a full day, where it's just him alone orbiting the moon from about 60 miles above. And not only is he alone, but half the time he's up there, he is in total darkness because every 48 minutes he passed behind the dark side of the moon, meaning no light and no contact. Houston, all your systems are looking good. Going around the corner, we'll see you on the other side. Over. Right. This is Apollo Control. We've had lots of signal now. We'll reacquire the spacecraft again on the 13th revolution in about 45 minutes. Mm -hmm.
Collins did this 23 times in total, 23 times for 45 minutes at a time. All he had was his heartbeat, his thoughts, and the darkness. And while he's sitting up there, he knows that the hardest and riskiest moment of this mission is actually yet to come. Because before they can go home, Buzz and Neil, you know, they need to get off of the moon. They need to blast off at just the right time so that they'll be back in the moon's orbit at just the right spot so that Collins can grab them. And as if that wasn't enough. There was no way to test the engines on the Eagle taking off from the moon. There was no way to test it. It was completely untested. It was an unknown. Yeah, we just didn't actually understand the moon's surface enough to know how this would go. So what happens if, you know, the engine doesn't have quite enough gas to get them back to the orbiter? Or what if um, they overshoot it? And privately, the three astronauts gave themselves about a 50-50 chance of getting off the moon. So... Michael Collins is orbiting all by himself, wondering if he's going to return to Earth alone or as part of a three-person crew successfully having visited the moon. This is Apollo Control. Collins has gone behind the moon on the 23rd Lunar Revolution. While he waits for his comrades to rejoin him for the trip back to Earth. I mean, just picture this for a moment with me. Um, on one side of the moon, facing back towards Earth, you've got Armstrong, who has just stepped onto the surface and is broadcasting back his famous line. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And then on the other side of the moon, in total, total darkness, you've got Mike Collins. So in this moment that literally the entire Earth is experiencing something together, he remains alone, disconnected and out of, out of touch from all of them. Exactly. So, oh my gosh, this is, this is what I keep going back to. Um, this is where having a Walkman, having it, this, this hunk of aluminum with the record button, this is where this suddenly becomes, as I said, mission critical. Because while well, Collins was up there, the most solitary man in the history of the universe, to calm his nerves or get the voices out of his head, he turned to a cassette tape. He pulled out his TC-50, his Walkman, and hit that red record button. And said, my secret terror for the last six months has been leaving them on the moon and returning to Earth alone. Now I am within minutes of finding out the truth of the matter. Dude, if you're alone, if you're on the dark side of the moon and all you have is a Walkman, how is that cassette not your very best friend? The closest thing you have to another human being, a listening ear, a shoulder to cry on, I think that cassette is a life raft.
meets the goals of the day. Someone waits for me. Uh, that is our show for you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so, so much for coming. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, a couple quick, quick special thanks uh, to uh, Sarah Rose Leonard and Lance Gardner at KQED for producing this with me out there in San Francisco. To Sarah Sandbach for making tonight possible. Um, to Soren Wheeler for his editorial guidance. Alex Overington, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and of course, Tara Isabella Burton for her knowledge and intellect. Uh, check out her books, you won't be disappointed. Zach Taylor for uh, being here with us tonight and making Act 3 possible. Check out his movie, Cassette, a documentary mixtape. Uh, and to my wife, Barbara, for everything. Uh, thank you so much and have a good night. Thank mm -hmm. you.